Uh, when I was uh, looking at this theme, two questions that came to my mind was, well, if we are to move from the act of instability to act of opportunity, what are the opportunities? And if there are opportunities, to what extent such opportunities adequately address the issues of instability and security? So having these questions in mind, you know, started to begin my search for opportunities. And in doing so, I was confronted with disconnected layers. Thus, my article, Peace Education and Peace Building in Solomon Islands, is my search for opportunities that peace education and peace building can, can generate to us as Solomon Islands from, from the act of instability to the act of opportunities. In my view, these opportunities um, you know, are interwoven into disconnected layers when appropriating development in Solomon Islands. Therefore, if we are to shift priorities, there is a greater need and realization that any shifting of opportunities, sorry, uh, priorities without serious consideration of the disconnected layers would mean shifting priorities to breed new challenges. Therefore, given this understanding, with that one of the key arguments that I develop in my article is there is a need for a deep cultural intervention. So with those uh, few introductory remarks, uh, this is the outline of my presentation this afternoon. I have to keep within the time limit, and I hope that it won't exceed 10 minutes so that I don't give a hard time to the, to the chair. Let's look at the, uh, the, the place of peace education. The place of peace education in post-conflict uh, peace building in Solomon Islands, what I see is that, you know, during the, the, the crisis, there has been a misuse of, you know, our customs purposely for personal gains. And therefore, if this misuse, misuse of custom is not addressed uh, during this post-conflict uh, reconstruction, you know, the norms that are embedded in our customs, you know, do not hold any future for younger generations. So within that line of thinking, I was of the view that if there is a provision for formal peace education, it should be one of the initi initiative, you know, in the post-conflict uh, reconstruction period. So coming from that, from that perspective, uh, I believe that, you know, we need to really, as far as the education system in Solomon Islands is concerned, there is a need, you know, for education to be put into action. And what I see here is that the ethnic uh, conflict in Solomon Islands uh, made the Solomon Islands education authorities to rethink the school curricula. Having come out of the ethnic conflict, they begin to see that there is a need you know, to incorporate the teaching of knowledge, skills, values uh, as a way of, you know, making the younger generation live in peace and harmony. So when they had a, a curriculum re uh, review after the, the crisis, they realized that one of the key themes as a result of that review is to ensure that learning opportunities will be able to, to make learners live in harmony with the environment so that they would be able to live together in, a, in their community. As a result of this curriculum uh, policy framework comes the integration of peace education into the new uh, junior secondary school social studies curriculum. So the, the integration of the peace 
uh, topic into the secondary school curriculum uh, is aimed at you know providing a bit of you know a sense of common citizenship uh, as a way of you know nation building because what the leaders are seeing is that you know we don't want to carry forward the, the wounds of the conflict and one of the realizations at the time is that if we want to to make our future generation forget the wounds of the, the, the conflict we need to incorporate the teaching of peace topics into the school curriculum so that's that's that, that's what we are, they are coming from I would like to show you a brief of you know how the topics are integrated here in the subjects that is an outline of what it is so it's not a standalone peace curriculum it's just an integration of some topics into the the, the, the various uh, subject uh, areas in the second uh, in the in the uh, junior secondary school curriculum so as you can see here like you know arts and culture in year 10 you know they have a strand called you know uh, cultural studies and then uh, under the same strand in Christian education they have Christian life uh, within the community and across each of those you will see that in uh, uh, as, uh, as those subjects are linked to the social studies curriculum you will see like in year 10 they have uh, sorry year 9 they have uh, topics like practicing peace uh, peace building and then practicing uh, peace in year 8 so that is our integration so where my my focus is on in terms of my my research was is how these peace topics are integrated into the social studies curriculum when i was looking at as i mentioned earlier on that when i was looking at the place of peace education in the solomon islands peace building at the national level i begin to see some of disconnected layers so the place that i'm coming from is to see to what extend that these disconnected layers would be able to reconnect the Solomon Islands society. And one of the pressing issues that those of you are reading with interest, the, the conflict in the Solomon Islands, you would agree with me that the underlying causes of the conflict are deep-seated traditional issues of land, compensation, and they remain important during the post-conflict reconstruction and peace building. So if these issues are not dealt with in the post-conflict reconstruction, then it will still continue to pose a big challenges in future. So the process of peace building as a prerequisite to post-conflict reconstruction cannot advance if these issues are ignored. So as we speak, these issues still remain as it were. There has been some talk about how to address it, but there has been nothing touchable to deal with all these issues. On the basis, what I uh, see as the danger is that the longer these issues remain unsolved, the more likely that it is, you know, resentment will continue to build up. And as that continues, what we continue to experience in the country is the uneven development and grievance uh, relating to powerful local perception of related deprivation due to these underlying issues would remain an obstacle to sustainable peace. So those are the, the key challenges uh, that, that we are facing. Foreign intervention without local input cannot solve complex traditional issues. And I think that that is clear enough for us to, to understand. And because of that, that's why some of those underlying issues is still been outstanding. Because people coming in and out, trying to offer assistance to resolving some of these development issues, they are not able to do it because they are rooted in complex traditional issues which even in our own culture we don't have the straightforward solution to them 
So in the absence of deep intervention, the more likely it is that new set of problems will arise, which can be detrimental to, to peace building. In closing, these are some of the lessons that we can learn from, from, from the issues in the Solomons. As I've mentioned that because of these disconnected layers, you know, the mismatches between form of peace building, peace education in schools, and community-based processes of building peace are as vital as large national and international peace building efforts. So what I see as one of the problems is that, you know, all forms of assistance, development assistance that are coming into the country are concentrating at the national level, whereas whatever improvements that are done at, at the national level are not able to be tangibly felt at the grassroots level. So there still remain a big a, a, a gap between what has been improved up there and what has been the current problem on the ground, the issues that, are, that, that people on the ground are living with. So, if we really need to forge a sustainable peace in the Solomon Islands, the same sort of assistance that are given at the national level in terms of, uh, of ensuring sustainable peace should as much as possible be done at the grassroots level. That's why you know, peace education has an important value a tool to enhance grassroots peace building initiative, which is need to be also supported by infrastructural community development activities, represent the most practical and successful approach. As such, given the, 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 the disconnected layers in the country's peace building, the long-term sustainable of peace remained a major challenge. Therefore, reconnecting peace building initiative through education can be a tool for civilization of peace into the future. Because what I see that has been happening is that a lot of peace initiatives are happening in the country, but the monitoring and coordination mechanism that are in place, it's not really able to, to congregate all those activities and program to ensure that they are directed to the common goal. We have the Ministry of Peace, uh, unity and reconciliation they are running their own peace building activities the ngos are doing their, their their bit as well but there is no coordination as to how those various organizations are implementing so there has been like a you know duplicating of activities save the children are doing theirs world vision are doing theirs the national government are doing their there's the ministry of education is incorporating the teaching of peace topics into the curriculum. So it's like a piecemeal approach in all those activities. So that's why I believe that, you know, if those areas of concerns are not dealt with, the sustainable peace in Solomon Islands still remain a challenge. M. Noma, thank you too much. Good afternoon everyone. My name is Serena Sasingen and I am from Papua New Guinea. I have been asked to talk this afternoon on developing opportunities for young people in my country. Um, I will focus a lot of my discussion as well on the work that I do with a youth development organization called The Voice. The environment that young people grow up in in Papua New Guinea is very complex. PNG has a young population of 40 with 40% 40 under the age of 15 and unfortunately they are entering adulthood amid a, a wide range of social issues. As is the case with most emerging democracies, Papua New Guinea continues to struggle with a number of challenges, including corruption, poor service delivery, high rates of unemployment, the spread of deadly diseases such as HIV and AIDS, uh, and the population continues to grow while it's putting a strain on the already limited public services. More and more young people are receiving uh, an education and are growing up with exposure to technologies such as mobile phones, internet and social media. With access to more opportunities comes with it the responsibility to take this young nation forward. An opportunity is defined as a set of circumstances that make it possible to do something. The objective of development is to create an enabling environment for people to 
realize their full potential and aspirations. Development has been sought and assessed, has long been sought and assessed in terms of uh, the economics with a particular focus on the annual growth of income per capita instead of the consequences of this growth and the quality it is um, the quality and improvement it is having on people's lives. If there is growth without it actually tr translating down to the improvement in the quality of life led by the people, then such growth almost becomes meaningless. Young people have great potential, but so much of that potential will go unrealized because daily survival is a, str is a struggle in itself. Whilst Papua New Guinea has experienced significant economic growth, the same cannot be attested to in terms of its position on the Human Development Index. Despite big projects such as the LNG and Octeni, uh, we hear PNG comes at 153 out of 187 countries on the Human Development Index. We can continue to look at the economy to, to bail us out, you know, increasing investments, increasing jobs, increasing uh, GNP and GDP, but I believe that it will take more than just a resource boom. It will take a whole paradigm shift that must be centered in a collective set of values that our people can stand on, united to build a nation. The central question that we seek to give answer to at this workshop is, is it time for Australia to shift its priorities from security to development in the South Pacific. I acknowledge that Australia is doing a lot of very good work through its aid program and other NGOs that um, are committed to, to helping countries like Papua New Guinea. Um, but my definite answer to this is that it, it should be yes, development should be the focus. But not only should it be development, it should be um, focus on human development. One of the central goals of human development is enabling people to become agents in their own lives and in their communities. Amiti Asen, argues in development activities, the people have to be seen as being actively involved in given the opportunity to shape their own destinies and not just as passive recipients on the fruits of kind of development programs. When Sen, what, what Sen alludes to is that development must rely on one's freedom to make decisions for themselves and to decide the kind of development that best suits them according to the priorities, according to their priorities and to choose the best means to achieve it. The idea of human development is not one that is foreign to policymakers in Papua New Guinea. Enshrined in the preamble of our constitution is our five national goals and directive principles that are meant to direct all persons and bodies corporate and unincorporated. Of particular importance to this paper is the first goal, and that is on integral human development, and it states, we declare our first goal to be for every person to be dynamically involved in the process of freeing himself or herself from every form of domination or oppression so that each man and woman will have the opportunity to develop as a whole person in relationship with others. It is interesting to see the way the statement is structured where it states that in order for people to seize opportunities to develop themselves, there is this recognition that first there must be a process whereby the individual has to be involved in freeing himself or herself from circumstances that strip that seek to oppress or restrict them. This barrier may not only refer to barriers placed by people, but can also refer to the freedom that must be first reached in one's mind. The goal then goes on to call for six, six sub-goals centered around education and health, the family institution, promotion of culture and sciences, um, etc. All the above sub goals deal with enabling factors that need to be present in order for people to reach their full potential. Unfortunately, we have not been able to realize much of what is written in those sub goals. But I wish to examine two of the six factors in light of how they impact youth. Firstly, in terms of education. For a country as diverse and complex as Papua New Guinea, schools are a major source where values can be taught to help shift, shift culture and transform society. According to statistics from the PNG National Statistical Office, over one third of school aged youths have not received any form of formal education, with females being most often male. With the introduction of the free education policy by the government to ensure all people receive their basic right to have an education, one must still raise the question is it free education that we need, or is it a quality education? The majority of school infrastructure in schools and universities in the country has deteriorated and most of these vital institutions are underfunded and understaffed. It is not only access to education that must be given consideration, but important components of the curriculum and pedagogy. 
Individuals can both acquire and employ skills which will reproduce society, or they can accumulate the skills needed to transform society. We can no longer reproduce the values and structures that have positioned our people to be the lowest ranking in terms of governance and other human development indicators. I would also like to spend time discussing the fifth sub-goal, which calls for um, that which is the family unit and for it to be recognized as the fundamental basis of our society. Unfortunately for large numbers of young people, home is not a place of safety or refuge with large numbers facing violence and abuse on a daily basis. According to the Family Support Center statistics, more and more violence against women happens in middle class families, where lawyers, policemen, and even church pastors strike their wives. There is a serious and fundamental flaw in the fabric of our society if such substandard behavior is tolerated. Why don't young people speak up? I believe the basis of why youth don't speak up is security and the strong held belief that one must honor their family. It comes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. People are driven by their biological and safety needs, food, shelter, security, and form stability. Without the social safety nets that need to be in place, such as proper law enforcement against perpetrators of domestic violence, um, economic uh, opportunities, and not enough public condemnation of the act, violence will continue in homes. The damage that can be done to one's sense of dignity and self-worth by perpetrators of violence is insurmountable. Let alone the damage done to the young people and the children who witness behavior models repeatedly and it does no good for ending the cycle of violence. If the family unit is the foundation on which any nation is built, this is a very real issue that needs to be addressed. We must first practice the values we preach in our homes and leaders in all levels of society must condemn such acts so that young people know that such behavior is not tolerated in our society. The discussion again draws back home the importance of young people becoming agents of their own destiny, allowing young people to go through a process where they actually embrace their individuality, their unique sense of who they are, whilst navigating where they will place their culture, religious beliefs, and the growing universal culture they're exposed to through media. I firmly believe that opportunities are there for young people in PNG. If not all, then certainly for the privileged ones that have found themselves born to parents that are able to offer them a decent education and essentials needed to progress themselves further in life. From my own personal experiences, some of the biggest barriers are the ones that I have allowed to be placed on myself whilst trying to fit into the status quo. <coughs> the constitution of PNG clearly promotes equality and participation of women and the protection of human rights. I believe that once those people who which the right and opportunity to exercise such freedom, start begin exercising them, you will see others liberated from their own state of oppression and start making more empowered decisions for their own life. I know because I have also overcome the challenge of growing up in a violent environment. And all I know is that I would never want to give my, my children um, exposure to the same kind of fear that, it, that you experience growing up in such homes. Perhaps that is the biggest motivation that drove me to start, and it continues to drive me um, as I currently am employed with the current, uh, with the organization that I'm employed with called Voice Inc. Six years ago, as a young university student with <laughs> third year studies, um, I had always believed that uh, our people deserve more, and, uh, that, and that's really what drove me to mobilize my peers to start what was then a student organization that promoted legal awareness in communities. Um, we were encouraged to involve more students and were given an office space by the University of PNG. Little did I know that I was embarking on a journey that would change the course and direction of my life. In 2009, due to the overwhelming response we were receiving outside from, for the work that we were doing, um, the leadership of the boys came together and had to make a critical decision of whether we were going to take the organization to the next level or if we would just continue on with our individual lives. Through that one year of reflection, we analyzed the problem around us and uh, came up with this environment statement. Many young people do not have a vision for their lives. Many live surrounded by violence, poverty, alcohol, and drug abuse, purposelessness, and idleness. And yet all people have a purpose in life. And lack of knowledge of that purpose causes us to live out below our potential. The key to having positive communities is to give our young people a sense of significance and relevance. It is by enabling them to realize the purpose and potential of their responsibility to use their gifts, talents, and passions, and dreams to serve their world. Armed with an exciting vision, I made up my mind four years ago that I would put aside my own ambition of being a policy lawyer, working with the government to build the voice speak for the betterment of the young people that were not given the same opportunities as me. 
That was by far the most liberating experience of my life when I made that decision to not strive for the approval of society and follow a calling I felt in my heart. My story took an unexpected twist with me finding myself working for a private law firm, something I had sworn to never do. It just so happened that whilst working at Gaines Lawyers, one of the clients of the firms uh, was a large donor in PNG and became aware, aware of the work of The Voice and subsequently offered uh, The Voice its first round of funding, relieving some of us that were paying for it out of our salaries um, and uh, allowing us to expand our reach and the quality of the programs. So why did I tell you my story? That is to show that opportunities do exist for our people. The question remains, will we be brave enough to go after them? A number of young people have worked full-time for The Voice over the course of the past six years, helping to build and grow the organization. I'm not the only one. Some have moved on to conquer their own fears and reach their goals, one of which being Miliona Saroa, PNG's first female officer cadet in the Defense Force. <coughs> The Voice Inc. is at the forefront of working with young people in educational institutions. It is a dynamic youth development organization it's based in Port Moresby and runs leadership programs with students in schools and universities in the country. The programs aim to build a sense of purpose in the students' lives, increase their confidence, and create avenues for them to contribute to their communities through projects. We believe that young, educated people have the potential to bring about significant changes PNG needs as they will one day be holding very influential positions in government and in the private sector. The University of PNG is our largest partner, um, where we've run leadership and active citizenship programs with hundreds of students. Many of these students have gone on to win leadership awards for their dedication to the service in their communities and are excelling in their studies and in their current place of um, employment. We have seen firsthand the benefits of providing a safe learning environment that promotes dialogue and mutual respect <coughs> Yep. Um, excellence and commitment to service. Perhaps we have captured a glimpse of what our forefathers had in mind when they saw men and women working together equally and creatively. The voice of the full and functioning board of directors made up of people both in Australia and in PNG and currently has four full-time staff working on all the programs and projects along with committed funding partners. The voice fully understands the hard realities of young people and has structured our leadership programs over a period of four years to take young people first through that process of self-discovery, second um, through understanding you know, teamwork and facilitation skills. We also have um, uh, trip sessions where we take them out on experiential learning voyages to rural areas um, in PNG to see development challenges firsthand and our programs then span to them taking international study tours as well. Um, and it's really exciting to see young Papua New Guinea stand very confidently in front of groups like yourself and they're able to articulate their ideas um, and they're not afraid to share what they, what they believe in and what they think. Um, as one of the major projects of The Voice, we're currently working in partnership with the University of PNG to build the first ever Centre for Leadership, a multi-purpose facility based at the main campus of the university. The purpose of the facility is to build the leadership capacity of students at the University of PNG and in high schools around the city to equip the next generation of decision makers with, character, with the character, skills and knowledge they need before they enter the workforce. Um, we're already a quarter of the way with raising funds for it. Um, and it, that's only been in one month of fundraising in January. So I believe that it will be a reality and you'll hear about it later in the year. Um, I wish to conclude with these words from Claire Assi, a young leader of The Voice. She wrote these words in her report after participating in a one-week Girl Challenge experiential learning voyage in the remote area of Garana Horebe province, where she helped build a library with a group of young people for the primary school. And she says, the rural challenge got me wondering a lot about my country and what I can do. We complicate it for ourselves by thinking we can task ourselves with big projects. It doesn't hurt to start small and then to grow from there. In fact, there will be a more lasting effect. Nowadays, I just can't go to a restaurant and devour my food without thinking that somewhere is a Papua New Guinean who's never been outside their village. I can't just lie in bed with crackers and onion dips watching a movie and or reading a novel without considering that somewhere is a Papua New Guinean who has never heard of Nelson Mandela or read Harry Potter by J.K. Rowling. We've accepted it as a norm for international organizations to help aid our people. But when a group of Papua New Guineans actually do something about their own country, it's something else altogether. It's a revolution. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, and uh, thanks for giving me your time this afternoon. I'd like to start by thanking the organisers of the workshop. It's um, a great way to cap off the Pacific Research Colloquium, which has been having, happening here at AU this past fortnight. So during PNG's constitutional crisis last year, 
Online activist groups were important in organising possibly the largest and most well organised political demonstrations that PNG has ever seen. At the time, there was a lot of discussions about the Melanesian Spring and excitement about the inter impact of the internet and social media on the possibility of improved governance outcomes in PNG and elsewhere in the Pacific. A lot of that excitement drew on the global furor surrounding events in Egypt in early 2011 and the role of social media in those events. Now, it's really easy to be cynical about that excitement and it's also very important to be cynical about that as well. But at the same time, it's also quite clear that new information and communication technology, ICT, including social media but also mobile phones and the internet more broadly, is an increasingly vibrant medium of political communication in the so-called arc of instability. So up here I've got the logos, oh, well, I do. <laughs> up here I've got the logos of three of the most active, um, or three very active Facebook discussion forums. Uh, Sharp Talk on the left, FSII, FSII in the middle, and New Talk Talk Straight on the end. So this presentation will try and critically examine claims about the positive impact of ICT on governance outcomes in the Pacific. This is a very general overview, um, just as the arc of instability is a very general concept. I'll begin by giving some statistics on communication technologies in the Pacific, and then I'll incorporate this discussion into the concept of the arc of instability. I'll then move into outlining very generally some potential positives and negatives of ICT when it comes to political stability and governance in the Pacific. And finally, I'll try and present some hopefully useful takeaways on this issue. So, here are some stats. I'm not sure if you've ever seen them all, but um, what I'm trying to do here is show the story of information and communications technology in selected countries in the Pacific. So historically, the Pacific has been a bit of a black hole in an ICT sense. You can see that mainline print penetration um, has historically been very low. Uh, it's actually decreasing in some countries, um, <coughs> like Vanuatu, for example. Um, so there's, there's really not a lot happening there. So telephone lines per 100 people is not above 50% in any of the countries that I've selected there. 50, not above 50 lines per 100 people. Um, so the same is true of other sorts of media. So although radio was probably the most important media in the Pacific, there are large parts of the Pacific that still don't get any radio reception, and there are ongoing problems with local language production and maintenance and so on. Newspapers have also similarly been relatively limited in their reach. So although there's a vibrant independent media in most parts of the Pacific, we can't assume that most people within the South Pacific region are getting their news from the papers or from the radio, let alone TV. But you can see here that mobile phone penetration is increasing almost exponentially, and that's the story that we see all over the developing world. Um, as in the rest of the developing world, the internet use is increasing quite fast as well, and most of this increase is happening via people accessing the net on their mobile phones. It is important to remember, though, that internet access is still very low comparatively in the region. So it's still only about 2% in PNG and less than 10% in Vanuatu, the Solomon Islands and Samoa. So when we're talking about the impact of social media in particular, we have to remember that not that many people are really using the internet in the Pacific. Far more people are likely to be just using their phones to text or call each other. That will change as costs come down and connection rates increase, but at the moment, that's what we have to say. But the people who are on the internet do use social media. Although again, not as much as we might think. And I should clarify here that stats on internet use and social media people to come across and not really not really verifiable in any useful sense, but I put them up just so you can have a, have a crack at seeing what's going on. So what you can see on the graph on the far right there is Facebook users as a percentage of online and offline populations. The red column is the percentage of the online population in that country that uses Facebook. The blue column is the percentage of the total population of the country that uses Facebook. You can see some pretty stark differences there. Um, and in fact, in Samoa and Fiji, it looks like more than 100% of the online population uses Facebook. That's what I mean about the stats. I can only assume that that's coming from things like businesses registering their accounts as personal accounts and people having multiple accounts for different activities. Um, so what do these developments, what these developments do mean though, given all the qualifications that I've tried to give, is that mobile communication and new modern ICTs change the way that political information, or all information really, is produced and consumed. This information potentially becomes both produced and shared by peers, and traditional gatekeepers of political information in particular are potentially rendered far less important. So, why does this matter for our understanding of the arc of instability? Again, I'd like to point out that for me, the arc of instability, as it is for many people, is not that useful a concept. It's a bit problematic, it's a bit too general, and it's imbalanced in its framing of important and relevant issues. But what it does do is allow us to try and pinpoint what it is that makes this phenomenon relevant to Australian interests in particular. And we get at this via the impact of ICT on good governance. 
So as you can see from the quotes that I've put up there, Australian policy is inherently linked to fostering security, stability and cohesion in the region. And a bit further down the defence white paper from the second quote, this devolves into a discussion of state fragility and good governance. And intriguingly, this last quote is from the most recent World Bank strategy on implementation and good governance. And it explicitly links increasing use of modern ICTs with positive changes in governance. In fact, it lists it, lists it as the second most important change since uh, the last World Bank report on this issue. So, now I'd just like to briefly outline some of the ways that ICT can contribute to good governance and security, stability and cohesion, but also some of the ways that it can detract from these goals. It's important to note that there is little to no research done on these issues in the Pacific, so the examples that I'm using are largely from elsewhere. It's important to note too that there isn't really a lot of very rigorous research on ICTs and governance in general. There's just not that much. There's a lot of hype and a lot of anecdotal evidence, but not much more. But the economic benefits of modern ICT use are probably the most clear-cut clear -cut and well-studied of all of these. And you see that we can make the clearest claims, although of course there are important qualifications to be made. To put it very simply, on the plus side, research from around the world has shown that ICT use can contribute up to a 1.7% increase in GDP in developing countries. That's the Kyung and Solo paper there. Um, Michelle Kyung is a senior World Bank economist, and that's a great paper if, you, if you'd like to read more about this. Um, Indeed, the PNG, some commentators suggested that the introduction of mobile phones and associated competition in the telecoms market in PNG in, I think, 2007 increased GDP by 0.7% in just over a year. That claim hasn't been tested, but it fits in with work that's been done elsewhere. Apart from just increased competition in the telecoms market, though, mobiles in particular act as a generator of growth in other areas. There are some very important mobile banking projects happening now in the Pacific region, for example, which in themselves can facilitate other projects such as microfinance and microinsurance for previously unnamed members of the population. So in PNG, for example, BSP recorded over 320,000 mobile money registrations in 2012 and just over 6.8 million transactions. That's 6.8 million transactions and the service was only introduced in 2009. ICT also facilitates remittance flows by reducing costs and increasing speed and a recent World Bank paper from um, CGAP um, points out that South Pacific is actually a hotspot for mobile money um, programs and particularly remittance programs and that's largely because of a fairly stable, comparatively stable regulatory environment for telecommunications. On the political side, modern ICTs have been shown elsewhere to facilitate government transparency and accountability and citizen engagement. So on the first of those, open government projects which release funding data um, on sort of government projects, what your local members up to, that sort of thing have allowed citizens in Poland, Malaysia and Brazil, for example, to track what their politicians vote on in Parliament, where their funding comes from, where the funding goes, and how spending is allocated. And it also has allowed them to contact their representatives collectively on certain issues which this data raises. There isn't really anything comparable to these uh, websites in the Pacific at the moment, in the sense of databases and other websites set up specifically for these open government style initiatives. The closest, I think, is a little used website in PNG called Fix My Road, which maps problems with roads. Other websites focus specifically on um, revealing and tracking corruptions. So for example, the Indian website ipaybribe.com allows users to register where, where to and where to whom they paid a bribe and how much they paid. And several prosecutions at local level resignations have actually resulted from that website. In Kenya, the Kenyan Anti-Corruption Council has initiated an online corruption reporting system where people can maintain anonymity but report, give detailed reports of corruption that they encounter. Um, now, there haven't been any prosecutions resulting from that. This is an ongoing problem with, with this, this idea of ICT for transparency. You can be as transparent as you like, but if you don't have the institutions to support that, nothing much is going to happen. But what it does do, at least in the Kenyan case, um, because the data has fairly stringent reporting requirements, what you're giving are patterns of reporting that are useful in themselves, I would argue. So in the Pacific, there aren't really any websites devoted specifically to revealing corruption, but what we do have is a very vibrant culture of blogs and discussion forums in many of the so-called arc states, and these have a real effect in highlighting corruption. So just to give two quick examples of where we've actually seen an offline reaction to online discussions. The Solomon Islands um, International Forum is at the moment, I think, being sued for defamation by the Prime Minister over allegations raised on the forum that he paid compensation for an extramarital affair. Similarly, Ben Marco, the Prime Minister and Neil's Chief of Staff in Fiji, raised the prospect of internet monitoring and crackdown on bloggers crackdowns on bloggers shortly after there were detailed discussions on Sharp Talk and PNG blogs about his corrupt activities. 
So part of this transparency activity relates to the role of ICTs in increasing citizen engagement with governments. And one of the fundamental goals of good governance is that engagement. On blogs and social media, you have people in the Pacific, possibly for the first time, discussing political issues collectively and organising offline protests. We've seen that in PNG, the Souls, and Vanuatu, Vanuatu in various forms. What you also have, intriguingly, is increasing political participation in online politics by politicians. From simply having a Facebook page to actively participating in online discussion. There's apparently a Sharp Talk Users Group in PNG Parliament, for example. And Facebook engagement arguably played a big role in the success of the Rowan Justice Party and Rowan Friggenbarney's success in the recent Belmont elections. Studies from elsewhere also show that online political discussions can encourage greater political engagement by historically underrepresented groups, such as women. And we're, certain, we're only seeing anecdotal evidence of this in the Pacific, but women are certainly playing a visible role in many online forums. Um, online forums can also engage diaspora members more effectively, up to 50, and we're seeing this in the Pacific Island, so up to 50% of Action Hours members apparently um, come from outside PNG, which I think is really striking, although difficult to test. I think in the Pacific too, ICT could be a useful way um, to connect urban and rural communities linked by internal migration patterns. So a slightly different way of thinking about diaspora and possibly one that's more relevant to the Pacific, um, and a way of engaging kind of village and urban communities in certain types of political discussions. But as I said previously, it's important to critically analyse the effect of modern ICTs on political life in our region. Studies elsewhere have shown that as well as potentially increasing citizen engagement, for example, new media can inspire fracturing and disengagement. A recent study in Tanzania found that increased exposure to election information via the internet made citizens less, li less likely to vote. They were just overwhelmed by the amount of information, made increasingly cynical by the amount of viewpoints available to them and, and the level of scandal in the reporting. Um, other studies, though mainly in developed countries, have shown that uh, political engagement by the internet can increase the fracturing of political identities. And you can arguably see this in Fiji, I would, I would say, where despite a vibrant political blogosphere, blogs are not helping to create a coordinated opposition, and rather they're entrenching divisions which already exist. The literature to elsewhere suggests that political engagement via modern ICTs can facil facilitate and intensify scandal and rumour politics in a way that's really unhelpful for building stable collective political identities. And I think that's what we're seeing in Fiji. Seeing in Fiji. We can also point to less than positive effects for women and gender relations. So probably the only in-depth study of mobile use in PNG is done by a woman called Dr. Amanda Watson. And her work shows that mobile phones are having disruptive effects on traditional values. And anecdotal stories from all over the Pacific suggest that women are feeling the brunt of this, as might be expected. Perhaps the most important downside from Australia's perspective, though, is the link between new ICT and collective violence. Most of the incidences in which Australian security agencies have been engaged on the ground in the Pacific recently have been the result of street violence. Uh, so in PNG, for example, in 2009, anti-Chinese riots, in the Solomon Islands in 2006, and also in Kenya in 2006. Studies after the Kenyan election of 2008 show that the key role there that mobile phones played in encouraging collective violence. So what you had there were phone trees established by political parties to get information out about the vote. And what happened was, as the vote sort of became contested, uh, text messages were sent out on those phone trees encouraging people to act in violent ways. And that was encouraged by supporting radio broadcasts. So the link between radio and mobile phones in that example, I think, is important to highlight here, as it raises the role of media ecology, media ecology in understanding the political impact of new communication technology. So when I say media, media ecology, I mean the interplay between different types of communication technologies, so between phones, TV, radio, and so on. In PNG, for example, people listen to the um, radio on their phones, and studies have shown that in Tahrir Square, that was a really important sort of thing to understand, the interplay between Al Jazeera, social media, and phones. But again, back to the Pacific. It, the protests with that we know have um, been organised largely by, uh, largely online by mobile phone, have been peaceful in the Pacific. Um, but given the history of uh, ethnic mobilisation on some issues and street violence in some parts of the Pacific, I think that that's possibly the most important and immediate focus for the argument security lens. This is particularly important to note given the demographics of the Pacific, um, the so-called youth bulge, and as Sarah pointed out, that just the youth of the population. These are the people who are using this technology, and these are the people who's, uh, who's, whose use of the technology is important to understand. Oops, wrong way. Okay, so to finish, what can we take away from this very general discussion? First, things are changing in the information and communication sector in the Pacific, and quite rapidly. This is likely to affect governance and security issues of interest to both Pacific Island states and Australia, simply because it means a fundamental shift in the way people talk about and organise around politics. Secondly, there's a lot we don't know, and there's a lot of hype to cut through. Most studies on the political impact of ICT have been conducted in the developed world. Uh, very few have been conducted in developing democracies. 
and even fewer, close to none, have been conducted on the Pacific. The political, political impact of ICT is dependent on many variables, not least of which are the pre-existing political environment and the history of political organising and collective identity in different communities. We don't really know, even in, even in developed economies, for example, what makes some people organise online and then act offline, and let alone we know that about that elsewhere. The concept of information culture is really important here. That means uh, the way that different communities conceptualise truth, authority and information. And understanding this, I would argue, is key to understanding the impact of ICT on politics in the Pacific. But we haven't even begun, begun to do that. So we can't assume that Papua New Guineans and Tongans use the internet or their mobile phones in the same way, for example, or that men and women do, or perhaps most importantly, that urban and rural communities do. Thirdly and finally, there's a lot to be done. Understanding the impact of ICT in the Pacific brings together a whole lot of really interesting fields of academic inquiry, fields as diverse as political economy, anthropology, linguistics, and of course, security studies. If the arc of instability is truly an arc of opportunity, then that opportunity lies in a large part in understanding this intriguing phenomenon. Uh, this presentation is a preface of a longer version of the paper that I had prepared for, for the workshop. The presentation focuses on youth participation in Fiji and the opportunities that exist for Australian uh, engagement. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers specifically for asking me to engage in this topic because it's also given me the opportunity uh, for the first time to, to think about uh, Australian involvement and Australian engagement with youth participation in Fiji, uh, an issue, a topic that I've been working on for, uh, for some time. Now, uh, my focus will be on the Fiji Community Development Program, a recent uh, program in Fiji spending a, a number of years with about a uh, couple of million dollars over the, over the five years, working on uh, capacity building CSOs and funding CSO uh, activities, and also exploring in general terms some possible forms of meaningful engagement with Fijian young people. Fiji has a very youthful population with uh, 15 to 24 year olds making up, a, up about a quarter of the population, about 160,000, uh, and could be even higher, about one third, if one considers the social definition of young people, which is between 15 to 35 years of age. A youth bulge coupled with unemployment, poverty, premature schooling, and health-related concerns often preoccupy the functions and planning priorities of the government and international development partners. However, young people themselves rarely participate in this process. And by participation, here I'm referring to youth activity that influences socioeconomic and political change concerned with influencing the nature of the society that young people want to live in. The current landscape of young people's participation in Fiji is sporadic, despite the existence of a national youth policy and related regional documents that explicitly promote youth participation. The most common form of involvement is through performance and responsibility, things that young people do in a traditional context. With civic and political contribution very infrequent and often tokenistic, a small number of active young people predominantly in urban areas are involved with non-governmental organizations, many of which appear to be elitist in nature. The existing scenario of youth participation in Fiji, I think, has evolved because of the government and relevant stakeholders who failed to establish, establish sorry, meaningful and sustainable structures that accord young people legislative, policy, and practice provisions for participation at the different levels of society that they exist in. Traditionally, the silent voices of Fiji's young people exist within adult structures of control. These voices have been silenced even further following the coup of 2006. Fiji's current political environment makes it difficult to exercise civic and political rights. In an environment where democracy is compromised, the government rules by decrees, media freedom is curtailed, there is little political accountability and selective public consultation Establishing meaningful and sustainable participatory structures for young people is a challenge. This poses challenges for active citizenship and is compounded by critical issues like unemployment and health-related concerns. It is estimated that about 22% or 35,000 of Fiji's youth population is unemployed. This number again could be more if it includes the social 
definition of young people and those young people who are engaged in the subsistence sector as well as the informal sector. The urgency of the situation is reflected in more than 20,000 individuals, many of them young people, who are registered with the Fiji National Employment Centre. Health concerns such as lifestyle diseases, obesity and diabetes, especially amongst urban young people, suicide and attempted suicide, alcohol and drug misuse, HIV and AIDS, are real and pressing concerns amongst young people. These issues and others like education and climate change impact on the lives of Fiji's youth population, more so for vulnerable youth subgroups. And by vulnerable youth subgroups, I, I refer to young people uh, in the rural areas, young people with disabilities, um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender young people. In this context, the participation of young people becomes critical. How can participation be acknowledged and supported in a stifling context and with limited resources. Given these and other internal challenges, the next section I considers opportunities for Australian involvement in enhancing and influencing meaningful youth participation in Fiji. Australia has been consistent in its call for the restoration of democracy, perhaps in pending elections in 2014, and a return to dem parliamentary democracy would pave the way for development of young people's participatory processes and structures as Australia reassesses its diplomatic love-hate relationship with Fiji's regime amidst recent developments and reforms, there is scope for Australian engagement with Fiji's citizens, in particular young people, at the community level. This is because current Australian engagement with Fiji is channeled through development partners and organisations, many of whom engage young people either directly or indirectly, or whose space accords young people opportunities for active involvement. This consideration takes into account Australia's long-term security and now growing development agenda in Fiji and the region generally. At the core of this interest is a concern for a robust economy and a stable democracy in Fiji, and young people, I believe, are integral to attaining this. Fiji and Australia have had a long and amicable relationship. This relationship exists at various levels. Economically, Australia is one of Fiji's major trading partners with a total trade between 2011 and 2012 totaling 490 million Australian dollars. Australia remains as Fiji's main export destination, receiving about 20% of Fiji's products. Fiji's tourism industry is boosted by about 300,000 Australian tourists to Fiji a year. At the same time, Australia is home to more than 50,000 former Fiji residents and a popular study and holiday destination for many Fijians. At the diplomatic level, current Australia, Australian relationship with Fiji is often tense and fractured due to Fiji's political turmoil over the years. As a result, much of Australia's foreign policy and assistance to Fiji is contingent on Fiji's commitment to returning to parliamentary democracy. To this effect, Australia provided Fiji $4.9 million as assistance towards the elections office, voter registration exercise, and constitutional consultations. Australia's presence in Fiji is most visible through its status as Fiji's largest bilateral donor. From 20, 2005 to 2012, Australian funding to Fiji totaled around 413 million. Aussie's 2012 to 2014 Fiji country strategy maintains its high level of assistance with the promise of Australian $55 million a year to target poverty and vulnerable communities. The Fiji Community Development Program is deemed very integral in this process. This program supports the relevance of Australian presence in Fiji and consolidates its people-to-people -people relationship at the community level. Current Australian engagement with Fiji is strongly influenced by Fiji's Millennium Development Goal performance and target specific socioeconomic, geographic and demographic cohorts. Institutional strengthening focuses on primary education, child and maternal health, women's economic empowerment and the prevention of violence against women. There is no specific mention of young people in these initiatives. However, it is expected that young people in particular are implicated. The most visible engagement between Australia and Fiji in relation to young people 
has been in the area of sports and study assistance in the form of the Australian Development Assistance and the Australian Regional Development Scholarships and access to training at the Australian Pacific Technical College. Opportunities exist to make Australian engagement with Fijian young people more explicit, particularly in the prioritised areas of poverty reduction, education, health and civic contribution. Given the known challenges of effecting structural and institutional change in Fiji, possibilities lie in tailoring strategies with Australian priorities at the local level. A realistic option of engaging young people with, within Australia's current engagement framework is through the Fiji Community Development Program that I alluded to earlier. This will address a major gap identified in the findings of the Fijian CSO survey that none of the organizations surveyed worked with young people as their primary focus. Factoring the involvement of young people in the Fiji Community Development Program offers a realistic opportunity to enhance community youth participation involve active young people and address challenges related to funding and capacity building. This, I think, would be explored in the following general ways. Include young people in collaborative decision-making structures of the Fiji Community Development Program. The percentage of the CSO recipients under the Fiji Development Community Development Program should have an active youth membership and have young people as their main service users. Strengthening rural youth organizations, governance, and participatory structures. This will ensure that young people operate in transparent and accountable ways, and at the same time acquire leadership skills. This attends to some of the capacity building focus of the National Youth Council, and works towards the development of civic competence for young people, many of whom would be removed from formal setting where civic education and learning takes place and to establish a competitive youth fund within the Fiji Community Development Funding Model to support youth initiatives that support income sustainability, livelihood options, and health concerns. Purposeful youth activities in local communities could help address concerns about youth, urban youth migration, and related issues. Proposed initiatives, I think, should include a consciousness-raising component. Activities that influence and create change have a higher chance of succeeding. Other possible forms of engagement that I've been toying with when, when thinking about this, uh, this presentation uh, is working holidays. Fiji does not qualify under current Pacific Seasonal Worker Scheme, and the reasons for this are obvious. But I think a way of addressing Fiji's skilled youth unemployment scenario, as well as labor shortages in certain Australian sectors, rest with granting young Fijians working holidays in Australia. The possibility is worth exploring as diplomatic relations between the two countries improve. Another, another area is mentoring. Between 2012 and 2014, 70 new volunteer placements will be created in Fiji each year. Volunteers work in a broad range of sectors. However, the nature of their work and interaction with host organizations and the community at large is not well understood. Part of the general assumption paints volunteers as holiday makers during their time in Fiji. A possible way of developing a volunteer youth partnership is to establish a body or mentoring program around volunteer placements for young employees in host organizations or other young people with an association to host organizations. Supporting research and young researchers. Australia can play a significant role in supporting youth research and emerging young researchers. Youth development related research and sectorial research that prioritizes young people in Fiji or even in the region is scarce. In addition, promising young researchers are often lost to NGOs that offer lucrative, lucrative career opportunities. It is encouraging that the research priorities outlined in OZED's research strategy 2012-2016 will benefit some young, young people. As a result, future OZED funded research in Fiji could emphasize how the research process and outcomes could involve and benefit young people and stakeholders in the youth development sector. These are institutions and research units that benefit from OZED funding 
and who the researchers work in Fiji should consider partnering with local institutions, in particular young researchers. Emerging researchers have over the past years participated in events hosted by OSAID's research partners like SSGM in the Pacific Research Colloquium. The impact of such short-term exposure is unknown. The critical point is that young Fijian researchers and the Pacific peers cannot continuously be beneficiaries of activities touted to build their capacity. They deserve a bigger and meaningful stake in research institutes and units that have an interest in the region. To conclude, engaging with Fijian young people is not an isolated exercise. Challenges to their identified propositions exist in different echelons of Fijian society and the greater Australian agenda. The presentation has offered some thoughts on opportunities to support and enhance in a meaningful way youth participation. The discussion prioritizes the youth agenda and in some way problematizes current development priorities for Australian engagement with Fiji. At the same time, it is possible that consideration for Australian engagement with Fiji young people will be viewed with concern by conservatives, particularly in Fiji, wary of changing experiences of and outs and of outside influences on young people. The critical issue is that Fijian young people, both passive and active, are stifled in Fiji and experience limited participatory opportunities to address issues and realize aspirations. For too long, Fijian young people have been let down by their leaders, with many seeing future, the future elsewhere, even if these only exist as dreams. These dreams could be realized with direct Australian engagement with young people in some of the identified areas. Australia will openly engage with Fiji and is beginning to do so given that democratic standards and expectations are met. The sooner Fiji holds free and fair elections and demonstrate a genuine return to parliamentary democracy, the better it will be for its citizens, in particular young people, whose future rests not only in possibilities and opportunities from within, but equally from outside, from friends like Australia. Thank you.